his demand is that Jacob speaks his own name. What is your name? God says. Now in the Bible, names really mattered. They communicated who you really were, your true nature, your intent, your motives, your character. <clears throat> Jacob speaks his name, Jacob, and it means one who supplants, one who gets in the way of another, one who steals almost. Only in the face of that truth can God transform. And he gives Jacob a new name, Israel, one who has wrestled with God. Israel, the one who becomes the father of a nation, of a chosen people. And with it, Jacob gets his blessing. And then Jacob acknowledges, to his astonishment, that he has seen the face of God and survived it. Now, like our gospel today, it's an account of persistence, but it's so much more than that, isn't it? For in this story, in this Jacob story, it <coughs> places struggle, challenge, vulnerability, and wounding right at the centre of our encounter with the God who made us and redeemed us. The God who longs to transform us, if only we'll let him get close enough. If ever there was a biblical story that shows God's calling of the most unlikely people, it's this. He doesn't call us because we're good, talented, or great. He calls us as we are and then works with us, wrestling, if that's what it takes, to make us just good enough and very much dependent enough to be who we are called to be in service of God's world and his people. Now, I don't think anyone comes into ministry unless they've come face to face with God. Probably, occasionally, a little bit like Jacob, somewhere along the line. Because unless there's that deep sense somewhere inside of God saying, come hither, I want you. However disguised it gets from time to time in the midst of the struggles of training or the challenges of ministering in a world which sometimes doesn't seem very interested, unless that deep sense of come hither, unless that's there, no ministry will be authentic. Ken. I rather suspect that the lectionary has done us a favour by giving us these readings on the day when your parish has chosen to celebrate your service of God in reading ministry. I don't think it was deliberate, I think it just works like that. And for 44, was it 44 years? 42, I think. 42, you think? Right. Well, a lot of, it's more years than the Israelites were in the wilderness. <laughs> For well over 40 years, you have kept on keeping on. And I can't imagine for one minute, Ken, that it's been without the occasional struggle. And what better epistle could we have had than that classic passage from 2 Timothy about the unique power of the scriptures, the God breathed word of God, alive and active. Ken, you preached that word, as Paul commanded Timothy to, for 40-something years. And from what I hear, by how you and June have lived, and what you and your family have done, you've also done the work of an evangelist as Paul also exhorts Timothy. And I know that you're hugely supportive of those just starting out on the journey towards reading ministry. So, to Mark and Christine in your reader training, and actually to Jim in your ordination training, and to any others considering God's call on your lives, can I 
say just two things. First is this. You cannot be an effective preacher, teacher, or priest unless you are deeply and consistently immersed in the scriptures through study, using all the tools, scholarly and otherwise, at your disposal to help you prepare to proclaim the gospel afresh in this generation. That's the first thing. The second thing, if it's a bit of a struggle and you find yourself wrestling from time to time, you're in good company. <coughs> but don't give up. And to everybody here, real encounter with the living word, the living God, is not just for those in training for authorised, licensed or ordained ministry. It's offered as a free gift to us all, not least every time we come to the altar to receive Holy Communion or to receive the prayer of others and the blessing of God in anointing with oil which can heal and reconcile. And the second thing I'd like to say to you is that the task of praying and not losing heart is as urgent in our world today as it has ever been. It can be a risky business, full of struggle and contradiction, very hard work at times and tough to keep going. But it can also enable us to see ourselves as God sees us. And that's normally an awful lot better than we see ourselves. And it can open us to God's call on our lives. That will almost certainly involve embracing our humanity as fully as possible. Because as St. Irenaeus once said, the glory of God is a, fully, is a human being fully alive. Now, the lectionary can be a bit like an episode of EastEnders, always leaving you on a cliffhanger, wondering what happens next. What did happen when Jacob met Esau after 20 years? Now, remember that the person who actually met Esau was a different one from the person who had planned to meet him, because he'd been transformed by his wrestling encounter with the living God. Jacob saw Esau run to meet him. He felt Esau's arms thrown around his neck, embracing him and kissing him. And they shed tears together. Now what was Jacob's response? to the generous, forgiving, reconciling action of his brother. This is what he said to him. Truly, to see your face, Esau, is like seeing the face 